Hi there, my name is Craig Beck from StopDrinkingExpert.com. And today I want to tell you about the five biggest mistakes that people make when they try and quit drinking. Each one of these is huge and has the power to pull you straight back into the miserable loop of daily drinking or binge drinking. So we'll go through each one and every single one of them is exceptionally powerful for you to understand and know about because it could save you a lot of pain and misery. Before that, just wanna remind you in 2019, I have some awesome events coming. First one is going to be the Quit Drinking Boot Camp back in London for the second time in Covent Garden. Uh, they always sell out these things. The demand is much more than the supply, so I urge you, if you're serious about quitting drinking, if you're serious about getting out of this miserable loop of waking up every morning full of guilt and regret because yet again you drank when you said you wouldn't, there is nothing more powerful than my one-day quit drinking boot camp. January 12th, 2019, London, England. Go to the website right now and reserve your place. Uh, we've got Nashville coming in February and Toronto, Canada in March. And also Toronto will be the first location for my brand new Unleash Your Full Potential seminar. You can get more details about that at craigbeck.com. So let's get on to these five things that people do all the time that makes quitting drinking so much more difficult. And the first one is failing to replace the time being taken up by alcohol. When you quit drinking, you may be shocked to discover how long a day really is. And that sounds like, on the surface, that sounds like that should be a good thing, right? I mean, who doesn't want more time? It is the one thing that you just can't make more of. And it is a good thing when you work this out, but initially this can be a huge problem because, you know, back when I was a drinker, I used to go to bed at 8 p.m because I was barely conscious by 8 p.m. I would get home from work and I would drink two bottles of wine sitting in my lazy boy armchair until I nearly collapsed. And then I would drag myself off to bed where I would have like 12 hours of terrible quality sleep and wake up exhausted in the morning, every morning. And I did this for oh, 10, 15 years of my life. I used to go to bed before my children. I mean, it's sad, isn't it? How, how many amazing moments of my children growing up did I miss because I was simply drugged? It's scary. Now, the problem is, if you, unless you replace all that time that alcohol was taking, you're going to find yourself sitting in that armchair like I was at you know, 9 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m. going, what am I going to do with my time? Oh, my God, I'm bored. And TV is much worse than I thought it was. And you don't want that because anytime you get into that situation, that evil clown of alcohol addiction that lives in your head is going to jump up and go, hey, 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 buddy, I got a solution to this. You don't need to be bored. You don't need to be lonely. Just have a drink. Just one drink. Just to take the edge off. And that's all it will ever suggest is just one drink. It doesn't need to suggest, hey, why don't you drink a bottle of vodka? Because it knows once you start you won't stop. And so it'll only ever suggest one drink to take the edge off or something equally seemingly harmless. So what I encourage you to do before you quit drinking is make sure your diary is ram packed with amazing fun stuff to do for at least three weeks. You know, in the course, at stopdrinkingexpert.com and at the boot camp, I talk about the stages of dealing with this. You know, the first stage is the first two weeks when you go through what I call the kick, which is the physical uh, effect of the drug on your body. Only lasts two weeks, it's very mild. Uh, it's best described as kind of a mild feeling of anxiety, that kind of jittery feeling that when you verbalize it as, oh, I could do with a drink, that is the kick from the drug. Alcohol uses carrot and stick to motivate you. So it will make you feel uneasy, stressed, on edge. And then when you drink, it will reward you by taking away that sensation for a bit. When it wants you to drink again, it will bring back in the stick. And you go after the carrot again and you get, this is how a loop starts to form, you see? 
So for the first two weeks, you've got the physical kick, and we say it takes about three weeks, four weeks to develop new habits. So the reason I say is ram your diary full of amazing stuff for three weeks is for that reason. Now, there is almost certainly things that you love to do that you're really passionate about that you've let go because of alcohol. There will be things you used to do in the past that you thought were amazing, great fun, but you either couldn't do them while you were drinking or you just decided to drink instead or you became so physically out of shape you could no longer do those things anymore. For me personally, I used to be very keen uh, into photography and also martial arts. I used to love judo. Judo was my, I just adored judo, but I gave it up because A, you can't do judo when you're drunk and B, I was like 60 pounds overweight at the peak of my, my drinking and I just didn't have the physical fitness and the stamina to be able to compete anymore. So I had to give it up. Of course, I came up with justifications, came up with lies to tell myself, like I didn't enjoy it anymore or I was too old to do it. Ridiculous stuff. But there will be things that you used to do that you've dropped from your life because you gave alcohol preference. I encourage you to get yourself back into what you used to do. Book yourself on a course, start learning a language, look in the newspaper, great things you can take the kids to for the next few weeks, treat them to some of your time, which has been so ruthlessly robbed from them by this evil drug. Plan where you're going to take your wife or your husband on date night for the next few weeks. Do exciting, interesting, fascinating stuff so that you're not sat at home going, and now what? Oh my God, I'm bored. What am I going to do? This is a huge problem because it's just too easy to drink the anesthetic and make it go away. So ram your diary with the good stuff, okay? Number two on the list, the big mistakes that people make when they quit drinking is continuing to go to the places that you used to go when you were a drinker. I have some bad news for you. A lot of drinkers, they think they have lots of friends. They think they're very popular. They have a great social life. They have lots of people who care about them. Look, here's the harsh reality. A lot of the people that you label as friends are not really your friends. And if something terrible happened to you, if life got really difficult, you will find out in a hurry how many real friends you actually have. I know that's depressing. I know it's a little bit sad, but the truth is that drinkers hang around in groups because subconsciously they need the social proof. Subconsciously, they need some sort of safety in numbers illusion that they can buy into because intrinsically we know our bodies have evolved over millions of years to detect poison in our food and drinks. We subconsciously, intrinsically know that we are drinking poison and that can only be a bad thing. Our body is trying to warn us. And so we need some powerful, plausible deniability to carry on drinking poison, even though we know it's trying to kill us. And the best thing we've come up with is social proof. The fact that we can look at all these people that we care about. We can look at our own family and say, but my mom and my dad drink. So they wouldn't let anything bad happen to me. It's legal. The government endorses it. Seriously, you trust the government? You know, the marketing suggests that this is a harmless social pleasantry. And if you drink this stuff, you're more fun. You have a more fun life. You have a more enjoyable life, a fuller life, a richer life. It's all bullshit. It's all a lie. Alcohol kills three million people every year according to the World Health Organization. Three million families put one of their loved ones in the ground every year because of this harmless social pleasantry. There is no safety in numbers when it comes to alcohol. Just because a hundred other people are drinking the same thing at the same rate doesn't protect you from anything. It's like Russian roulette doesn't matter whether you play that game on your own or whether you play with 100 other people. Your odds always remain the same. There's no safety in numbers. So 
Stop going to bars and hanging around with your drinking buddies and sitting there with a Coke feeling miserable because you're just inviting trouble. Now, there is a saying that goes, you know, if you, if you sit in a barber shop long enough, you'll end up getting a haircut. Even if you don't want one, you'll just end up getting one eventually. If you go in a bar and sit there long enough at the initial stages of this process, you're inviting trouble into your life. All right. Uh, also, you will have some psychological pressure from your friends as well. You know, the one thing that these drinkers don't want is someone who breaks the social proof. They don't want anyone sitting there highlighting the real issue. And you probably find this when you stop drinking, your friends will really try and pressure you to just have one drink. And you might think, well, why would they? I've told them why I'm doing this. Why would they do this to me? Do they not understand? Or they understand, but they have psychological pain that says they either stop drinking themselves and then the pain will go away, or they get you drinking again and the pain will go away. Guess which one's easier? So they'll tell you that you're boring now, that you've changed, you're not as much fun to be with, uh, and you can just have one, surely, and so on and so on and so on until you break. That's the, that's the reality. All right, number three. Let's do number three. Number three is... The mistake of giving alcohol more power than it is entitled to. It is not the big bogeyman that you think it is. And I'm guilty of this as well, because back when I was a drinker, you know, when I was trying to stop drinking using willpower, I used to think this is so hard. Why is this so hard? Oh my God, I'm not sure I can do this. This is going to be a problem for the rest of my life. It's going to kill me. <laughs> And I get people at boot camp coming up to me saying, but Craig, it's so difficult. This is such a powerful drug. It's got me like this. How, what am I going to do? And I noticed something about six months ago that made me realize that, you know what? For problem drinkers, I'm not talking about alcoholics who are physically dependent on the drug. I'm talking about problem drinkers. People who drink a bottle of wine every night, you know, when the kids have gone to bed, that sort of routine. For problem drinkers, Choosing a sober, happy life is no different than any other big decision that you make about your life. You know, it's like um, I got married, to, you know, a couple of years ago, and I've put on about 10 pounds in weight in that time. And it's just purely contentment, you know? Instead of going out being social, my wife and I, we tend to just, you know, chill out together and she's a very good cook and oh I've got lots of great justifications and any other B BS you want to hear but anyway I put on I put on about 10 pounds and I stopped going to the gym so about six months ago I decided right enough is enough I don't like the way my clothes feel I'm going to start going to the gym again and it was about 18 months since I'd been so my first day at the gym with my personal trainer I got there and I got to tell you I hated it I despised it. I didn't just dislike it. I hated every single second of the moment in that time in the gym. Every minute felt like an hour. It was disgusting. I was, like, I was looking up to heaven going, is this some sort of joke? Is this God's joke that it must be this horrible? And, you know, I'd like to tell you that uh, I stuck at it and after about a week, I was really enjoying it. It took me six weeks, six weeks of going to the gym every day, miserable. I mean, I used to bitch and complain about it to my wife. Every morning I'd say, oh, I've got to go to the gym and it sucks. But I did it because I understood what I wanted to get out of it. And for six weeks, I hated it. 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 And then one day I found myself, I woke up and I thought, yeah, great. I'm going to the gym today. And it's then that I realized that we give alcohol far too much power. Because if you think about it, if you did the same thing with alcohol, if you, if you had the commitment and the passion for this, and just for six weeks you didn't drink without any instruction from me, from, without any book or without any, any help, after six weeks, you would also get to the point where you'd go, you know what? I kind of like life without alcohol. Yeah, it sucked for six weeks, but so does everything important when you make that sort of dramatic change in your life. You think it's easy becoming a vegan? You think, you know, someone who, who loves bacon sandwiches and steak and all these, 
all these types of food and then makes the conscious decision that they want to be a vegan because they love animals and animal welfare is just so important to them. You think it's just easy? Or do you think there's a period of adjustment where they hate it? They're thinking, oh, I just wish I could have, I'm sick of eating this. I wish I could have that. And so let's not give alcohol more power than it's due, yeah? Yeah, it's difficult, but so is everything, yeah? Going to the gym, getting into a fitness routine, becoming a vegetarian, changing big things in your life is difficult. But that's where the magic happens, you know? When you're out of your comfort zone, amazing things come into your life. So that's number three. Let's stop giving alcohol more power than it's due. Um, if you see me looking over here, by the way, it's because that's where my notes are. And I want to make sure I go through them in the right order. I don't know if it's my age, <laughs> but yesterday I tried to put the toothpaste on charge. I mean, you know, I walked over to the charger where I normally put my electric toothbrush and I had the toothpaste in my hand. I'm like, yeah, that's not going to work, Craig. Anyway, so my list is here. Number four. <sighs> There's a disconnect here. People stop drinking and find all these problems arrive in their life. They, you know, people email me all the time saying, I've, I stopped drinking and now this, I've started doing this, I've started sweating a lot. I've stopped drinking and I've noticed that uh, you know, I'm limping a bit more than used to. I've stopped drinking, I've noticed this pain that I had many years ago, it's come back. Or I've stopped drinking and I'm just having arguments with my wife all the time. We're just, we're, we're not getting on. I'm upset because, you know, you told me, Craig, that when I stop drinking, my life will get better. And that's true. But here's the thing. You know, if you point to the bad things that arrive in your life after you stop drinking and then say it's because of because I don't have alcohol anymore, there's a disconnect here. You're pointing at black and calling it white because actually what you're noticing is not the arrival of new problems, is the, is the problems that were always there that alcohol was covering up. And if you're tempted to think, well, isn't that a good thing? Isn't it a good thing to cover up my problems? Not really. <laughs> I mean, would you, you know, do you want cancer that you just don't know about? Or do you want cancer that you've identified quickly and you can deal with? You know, and it's the same of anything. Do you want to spend 30 years in a broken marriage? Or three years? You know, so there are lots of things in life that are wrong that alcohol just makes us avoid. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm testament to that because at the peak of my drinking, there were so many problems in my life that I just wasn't dealing with. My career was going nowhere. I was just cruising along in my career, kind of getting away with it. My marriage was dysfunctional. My, you know, there was no physical connection in my marriage anymore. We didn't even sleep in the same bedroom. We spent no time together. We just did our own thing. We were just two people who lived in the same house. And yet, because I was a zombie every night, I didn't deal with it. Uh, my health was, you know, I had sleep apnea, so I was waking up in a panic four or five times a night, not being able to breathe. Um, I can go on and on about, you know, my health problems, blood pressure and the pain in my side and all this sort of stuff. But alcohol just kind of covers it over in this wave of anesthesia. Because that's what it is. It's a mild anesthetic, you know. And if you have any aches and pains in your body, then the alcohol may well be just covering it up. Uh, and again, if you're thinking that's a benefit, and I had a guy come to Quit Drinking Boot Camp in San Francisco who said that he was using alcohol to deal with his back pain. He said, it's the only thing that works, Craig. You know, I drink the alcohol and the pain goes away. But he, I don't know if you noticed this, but if you go to the doctor, they never prescribe alcohol as a painkiller. <laughs> you know, we, we're about 300 years past that. You know, back in the day and they wanted to chop your leg off, they'd give you a bit of rum because that's all they had. We've progressed a long way since then. Doctors don't prescribe vodka if you have pain. So it's, it's, you know, it's not a genuine excuse. It's not a reason to drink. But if you stop drinking and pain appears, don't say, well, that's because I stopped drinking. Now I've got that pain. That bloody British guy, 
back. He's caused me to have a pain in my leg now because I've stopped drinking. The reality is the pain was probably always there, but the alcohol was covering it up. And so now that you're sober and you're lucid and you're clear headed about this, you can actually go to the doctor and find out what the pain is and get that dealt with. You can also address your relationships, your career, your finances, your health, and all these other things that you've been unable to deal with while you've been drinking the attractively packaged poison. Okay, so um, that is number four, assuming that alcohol was helping in some way, and of course it's not. Number five um, is being impatient. And this is you know, what, one of the most common emails I get from people is they say, well, you know, I, I haven't had a drink for three weeks and I still can't sleep at night. You told me everything would get better, Craig. Or, um, you know, uh, I, I haven't had a drink for three months and I'm still feeling lethargic. I still feel tired every day. You told me that when I stopped drinking and started sleeping properly, I would feel like I was full of energy. And the, the answer to that is always, you will. But you can't put a time limit on it. You can't say, well, I'm going to feel better in two weeks. It doesn't work like that, especially with this drug and how insidious it is. Because you don't get addicted to alcohol overnight. You don't even get addicted in a week or a month. For the most part, it takes years, sometimes decades to get addicted to alcohol. And this drug is so evil and so insidious, it will just quietly sit there watching you for decades until it's got you. And then it squeezes hold and says, and now you're never leaving. So you can't take something that took you years and years and years to develop and then expect to fix it in a week, a month, three months, whatever you want. It's going to take time. It's going to take patience. But what I believe the key to success in anything in life comes down to two things, passion and persistence. That's the root of everything. You have to be 100% passionate and enthusiastic about it. You have to be persistent. You know, one of my favorite quotes is, it's not about how hard you can hit, it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Do you know the movie? Put it in the comments below, tell me, <laughs> little quiz. So look, don't set timelines on this. Don't say that within three weeks, I'm gonna be sleeping better. Don't say that within three months, I'm gonna be you know, 20 pounds lighter. Don't put restrictions on yourself and say that this means success and this means failure. If you stop drinking poison for fun, you have already succeeded, you have already won. We'll deal with the other stuff later. It may be that there's an underlying cause why you're not sleeping or that you have low energy levels. And I would encourage you, if you get six months clear of alcohol and you still feel absolutely lethargic and terrible, to go to your doctor and get a full blood workup and find out what's going on in your body. Maybe the alcohol has been covering up something quite serious that you can fix now. But patience is super important, as are the other four areas that people make big mistakes with. So listen, thank you very much for joining me today. I'll remind you to like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. That would be amazing. Please, let's get this message out there and help a few more people get off this attractively packaged poison. I would love to meet you in person and shake your hand and take you through this process. Don't forget, Covent Garden, London, England, January 12th, 2019, Nashville, Tennessee, 24th of February. Uh, we got Toronto, Canada on the 30th and 31st of March. If you want details, go to stopdrinkingexpert.com. And also for my Unleashed Unlock Your Full Potential live event, go to craigbeck.com. Thank you very much, and I will see you soon. Worried about your drinking? Why not join us for a free quit drinking webinar? www.stopdrinkingexpert.com.